Hello, hello, and welcome to the RodeoKids.com podcast. My name is Isaiah Ellis, and today, me and Kaylin Pinkert interview Casey Kearney. This lady is a trooper. She took one of her only days off to record this podcast to help people out and had an amazing attitude through the whole thing. Now, this podcast is one of my favorite podcasts for sure. She not only has an amazing voice, but travels the road at rodeo with her kids and husband, and she gives God glory for all of it. You will hear it hasn't been easy on her, but she didn't give up. She chased what mattered to her, and it's really touched Kaylin and I, and I know it will you too. Now, enough of me talking. Let's jump into a podcast with Miss Casey Kearney. Welcome to the RodeoKids.com podcast, where we empower youth to be their best selves through the values and traditions of the rodeo and Western lifestyle. All right. Welcome, Miss Casey, to the podcast. My name is Isaiah Ellis. Um, we have Kaylin Pinkert here. Um, first off, before we start, I'm going to start off with a prayer um, to get us started. God, I thank you for your opportunities in life. I thank you for opportunities to do rodeo, and I thank you for the opportunity for us to do podcasts with people who have made a name for themselves. God, I pray that you allow us not to take this opportunity for granted, God. I pray that you allow us to give you glory in everything that we do, God, for we know that you give us these talents, but God, you can also take them away. So God, I pray that our, you we shine bright through you, God. I pray all these things in your name. Amen. Amen. All righty. So first off, Miss Casey, can you start off by telling us who you are and what you do? My name's Casey Kearney, and I play music. That's my job, but I also am a rodeo mom. I have three teenagers, and so that keeps us very busy as well. So um, first off, just tell us how you got started into singing. Um, so I actually didn't start when I was young. Lots of people, their story is, oh, I knew I was going to be a singer when I was young and you know doing I didn't I didn't at all I was actually giant pregnant with my third baby and I started learning how to play the guitar and then just uh writing songs and it um and just kind of went from there and then by the time they got up old enough I was like okay they're old enough to try to just do this thing so I went to Nashville so I was very much a late bloomer but it's been um it's been a different kind of journey than a lot of other people who try to do this career so it's been fun what was the start of that? You said you didn't start um, early like everybody else. What was kind of, can you lead us up to the start of that and then how you kind of got to where you are? Yeah, it's a mixture. So I, um, part of it, I was going through a lot of really rough patch in life and I just had all these emotions and feelings and just all the things in my head and into my heart. And I just needed a way to get them out. So I started writing. I had never written before, but I started just kind of writing it down, journaling, and it kind of almost came out and even still it does this on accident I don't mean to rhyme it just kind of comes out that way you know it comes out as poetry and so at the time I was doing that and then I had to start like learning about it's from uh kind of a necessity to get some of that like I don't want to say pain, but yeah, kind of. It was just a lot of rough life stuff going through it. And guitar wise, I had never even learned any instrument whatsoever. My sister gets a um, pink glitter guitar that I still have hanging on my wall. Um, she gets it for Christmas and she wasn't interested in playing it at all. And so I bought it from her for a hundred bucks. And then I was like, I want to learn how to play this guitar. This is the coolest thing ever. And I still am not good at electric at all, but it did get me started learning how to play and it did get me inspired to learn how to play. So if for that, I am thankful. <laughs> but yeah, anyways, I went from there and learned uh, guitar and piano and I can play a little bit here and there. Once you learn one, you can kind of start picking up the others. How did you start performing? Like, um, did you just perform for like family members, like family events, or did you start doing venues? I started in church, really, like my first few times of singing were in church and my first, you know, really few years of just really like being in front of people were in church. I had terrible, terrible stage fright. And um, some of those first things were there was a karaoke contest and it was going on and everybody up there looked so scared and so nervous. And I was like, I think if I got up there and I just had fun, like maybe people would, uh, maybe how people would like me because they could sing really good, but they just looked terrified. And so I just kind of did. And I ended up winning that day. And 
And um, when I did the one of the judges, he was like, you didn't have the best voice, but your stage presence got it for you and stuff with that, with the stage fright, it started clicking then. And um, so, yeah, between just kind of doing that and then um, church, eventually I started playing down at the beach on 38. My uncle, um, he had a venue down there and I could only play like I had enough songs for like one hour that I could play guitar and sing and um, actually early early I didn't even I couldn't even play I had a guy that came with me and played for me and um we played once a month so that's I only had enough songs I could get through to play once a month and yeah and so it was early it was very starts and actually that place that I started at the very last um event that they have is next month and so they invited me to come back and play that again just one last time and so yeah it's uh bittersweet to see it go but you know it just you just start like stepping stones and you just kind of start doing playing where you can and learning as you go always always the thing i like about you you said um you said i didn't start an ideal age i think that um i think that sometimes we can get so focused on uh, we didn't start at the age that everybody else started yep. at but if your dream if it's your dream it's your dream you know what i mean whether you want to start music at 70 years old or you want to start team roping at 70 years old it might not be ideal you might be getting lessons with people that aren't ideally your age or might not be ideally the event that everybody competes in but if it's your dream and you're willing to chase it it doesn't matter the age it doesn't matter I mean you've gone everywhere I mean it's just like it doesn't matter you don't have to start it 10 years old or 12 years old or have this big dream or have dreams for weeks about being some music pop star you know what I mean it's yeah. whatever your dream is whenever it comes to you I believe that um God has times for everything it might not have been it might not have been a plan for us right when we're in the beginning and that's okay it doesn't have to be but I like how even you've chased it even longer you know and it yeah. doesn't matter how early have you found that like a challenge like starting later on it's a mixed blessing for sure. I think that God places stuff in everybody. And I think that eventually you have to find ways um, to make it happen. And, and there are certain things that it's a drive inside of you that you just kind of have to go after that God just puts it inside of you. And you can't, and even if I try to put it down, I can't put it down. Like we got, we got to do this thing. And it wasn't always that way. Cause obviously I didn't know, you know, and it is, I mean, it's been a mixed blessing. There's, there's the it's never too late uh, part of me that is able to just to push that message and encourage it, use it to encourage other moms and other just people in general that you're like, yeah, I didn't end up doing the things I've always wanted to do this. Or I've always wanted to do that, you know? Um, but then at the same time, you're always playing catch up. So it can get discouraging sometimes when I, you know, I can only do so much because I wasn't in my closet at 16 playing guitar nonstop, you know, like, and that's when a lot of the major, major um, guitar players are just spinning their teens, just them and a guitar and just really learn the same thing with cowboys, you know, like some of those ones that are born into, they're born on a horse. And, you know, so I think that cowboys, a lot of times they'll feel that same uh, sense of I'm always trying to catch up because I wasn't born into a rodeo family. But then also you get a whole fresh outlook where they might be burning out at your age you're fresh and still like ready and inspired to go and do the thing. So yeah, I think it's a mixed blessing, but God puts it inside of us for a reason. And if we ignore it, it's uh, you're going to have a harder time getting rid of that drive and that push to go and do the thing. So you can't ignore it for sure. For sure. For sure. I know you said um, it was a while back, but you said how you started writing songs. Um, how long was it after you realized like, Hey, maybe this thing is for me. Like you started playing guitar, all that. Was it that you started writing songs? Um, it all kind of happened at the same time. I kind of learned, I was writing them like poetry at the same time I'm learning guitar chords and then I'm learning, you know what I mean? All of that happened before anything was decent. It took years. Like I wrote a bunch of terrible songs very early on. And so it takes years for you to really like learn how to do it. And even still now, some would argue some are better than uh, they're always songwriters, right? Some that are better than others, always. Um, some stuff I feel like, okay, wow, I can't even believe this is such a gift that I wrote it 
And then there's some of them that I'm like, that is so bad. But same thing early on, the majority of it's really, really bad. I think they say you write a hundred bad songs before you ever write a good one. Um, but no, I just kind of started learning all at the same time. Like it really was no time frame, And it's just years of just learning and honing in on your craft because it's really an art to it for sure. Stepping stones. Yeah. Um, it, it started off bad and it might not have looked. Was there ever a time where you doubted yourself? Because I mean, I think anything in life when it's bad and I mean, we've maybe I, I don't write music, but like maybe you've written 10 songs. You're like, oh my gosh, this is terrible. Or maybe I've gone out and I've missed 15 steers in a row. Was there ever a time you're doubting yourself and you're like, this ain't for me? You know, I even think that that's a mixture. I think there's part of it. But yeah, I doubt myself all, I still doubt myself all the time. Like you just do, you doubt yourself and you question like, am I good enough? Or like, is this really what I need to be doing or anything? Or even if you know you're supposed to be doing it, it doesn't mean you know that you're good enough. But also there's almost this blind confidence, especially early on, because all of those feelings are inside of you. And you're like, I just express them just like this. And I just put them out here just like this. And so you almost have like, it may not be a hit song, but it still was something that came from your heart and from your mind. And it was just still like laid out here. These are my feelings and these are my thoughts. And uh, yeah, so I almost think that you have a blind, uh, you know, when you're just like learning how to rope and you're like, I may be terrible right now, but I'm good. Right. Like, I'm going to make it. Right. You know, I think you just do. You just have that blind confidence. And sometimes and I listen back to them now and I thought, man, this was I have one song that I wrote early on that I still do today. That's how, you know, much you grow. And so I question, yeah, you question yourself all the time, but there's also still, I'm not gonna lie, a, a blind confidence because it's still art and it's subjective to say if it's, who's saying it's good or not, you know, like right. who's the standard here to say if it's, if you're good or bad. I mean, rodeo, you're either winning or you're losing, but at the same time, your win might look different than, somebody else's win a success for you is going to look different than somebody else's success if you win your yeah. local rodeo and it's your first rodeo that you ever won you may as well just won the nfr but there's yeah. all these the stepping stones that you know take you all the different places so i don't know if that answered your question or not <laughs> i think that was all over the yeah. place but <laughs> it for sure how did your family decide to get into rodeo um, me and my husband early on, so we got married really young and early on, um, we started learning how to barrel race and team rope and all that. And we were having a blast. Well, then we have kids and they were not interested in it at all. They played baseball and football. And so we sold everything cause you can't do both. Like we just couldn't keep doing rodeo and all the other stuff. So we sold everything. And then the kids hit like 10, 11, 12-ish, and they said, hey, we really want a rodeo. My husband had just sold his really good horse, and they were like, we think we really want a rodeo. And so we made them, like, just go try it a little while and see if it was gonna, if they were going to stick with it, and they sure enough did. So eventually we were all in, and then we were all the way in. So we um, just, you know, when they decided to do it, it's been a ride the past, I guess it's like five years now. Um, where we've been really hitting it hard. Um, multiple associations. We're gone just about every weekend. So, I mean, they got, but rodeo and music are a lot alike. They're both very addicting. And they're mm -hmm. both, um, I decided the other day that music is a soul crushing money pit that's an addiction you can't get rid of. And I think rodeo is the exact same way. So is rodeo. Oh <laughs> yep. my God. It's so the same. So the same. I think it's kind of cool how you can like, <laughs> connect these different things because I know your family rodeos you sing and how you just described it as like an addiction that yeah. makes so much sense to a bunch of other people I feel like because that's how like if you find something you truly love that's how it is yeah so yeah. I just I think that's pretty cool that you can connect your singing to your kids rodeo yeah thank you it's I think one thing that I thought was really interesting when the kids were growing up in baseball and football and we had to be like you need to get out there and practice you need to get out there and do that and I think when you find your passion like there's no making you like we it was more we had to punish them like no you're not roping tonight you know what I mean if they were doing stuff like you know what I mean like 
practice time ended up being more of a, it's something we're going to take away versus when they were playing, they liked football and they liked baseball, but they love rodeo, you know? And it's kind of the same with me. Like I almost find it so, I love when I get to go sit down with my guitar and just write a song. Like I love it. It's my favorite because I don't get to do it all the time, part of it. And because it's just my passion, it's what I love to do. So when it's not forced and it's not something, I'm not saying, like there's still times where you feel like it and don't feel like it. You know, this is my first day off and my last day off for a long time. And uh, there's times you don't feel like doing it. Obviously you want to break, but you know, it is, it's, it's really fun. I like connecting the worlds to music and rodeo. Like it's, it's funny, the parallels, the longer we're in it, the more we see how much alike we all really are. They <laughs> really, it really is. The more I talk, the more I talk to you, I realize how similar they are and like, yeah. I think that, like, they're definitely both. I know rodeo itself is very addicting and very, very expensive. It's like going and setting five hundred dollars on fire every rodeo. <laughs> but, exactly. But then you do good, and you're like, oh, I can't wait to do that again. Or you do yeah. bad, and you're like, let me redeem myself. <laughs> so then you yeah, go back yeah, out and do yeah. it again the next night, <laughs> exactly. the next weekend, or whatever. Always, yep. And uh, what? And talking about that, you said you sold everything. I, and then they want to get back in the rodeo. It has taken us years and years and years to collect all the rodeo gear and our rodeo equipment and everything that we have. If I was going to sell everything, we're going to be done. I'm not going to, like, no going back. Was that a hard, hard decision to make to go well, buy everything? Looking back now at everything that we had that first run, we didn't, compared to what we have now, uh, being fully invested we didn't have that much we just sold my barrel horse and my husband's roping horse we had I want to say we had like a bumper pull trailer um we kept our my saddle and his saddle we kept but then we sold like everything else like all the extra stuff so in comparison now to what we have we don't it's not even a comparison you know what I'm saying but the main thing was like the horses that we had were really they would have been perfect for the kids to learn on and then they ended up we sold them right before they decided to uh to start but yeah no now we have you know multiple trailers and living quarters trailer and so many horses there's constantly somebody's either training a horse or buying and selling a horse you never stop horse shopping and so it's just um you know, now it's a little, it's a whole lot different than it was when me and my husband were dabbling in it. <laughs> right. If we got out now, we'd be out, like done. Like, yeah, no, <laughs> there's, there's no getting out and getting back in. Cause you're right. It does. It takes years to accumulate all the things that you need to do this. Like it just does yes. years to find exactly the right fit of courses and trailers and everything, which we got a really, really good deal on our trailer. It was like trashed and we like, remodeled it and stuff and so now it looks like it's a really nice trailer but um we did and every time i look at other ones i'm like no i'm good with ours i'm good with ours like it's, uh -huh. it's paid for we ain't getting another one we're good we're good <laughs> yes one of the i i like um how you're talking about your trailer we bought we have two trailers we have a three slant and then we have a nine slant trailer and um they were both, I mean, they were just junk trailers. And mom and dad were bringing them home and we're like, what are you thinking? <laughs> like, out of all the things you can spend your money on, you bring this piece of junk back? We yeah. are never going to rodeo in this thing. And they're like, no, it's good, it's good. And I'm like, oh my gosh. And they're like, we're going to fix it up. As in we, I mean y'all. And so, yeah. like, we're talking about ripping floors out and putting in, like, painting the whole thing and changing out stuff in tack room and i mean and now our trailers don't look terrible i mean we're getting new trailers and stuff but like but when we first got them i'm like okay well um we lost him yeah i don't okay um i like how you said that you started with like a trailer that wasn't nice and everything i feel like because how we started was we got a little trailer that the little four slant needed cleaned up. It's like 1998 or something. Because oh. my dad wanted to make sure that like we actually were going to put the effort in. And mm. I feel like once you get invested in it, it's just so awesome that you can like keep growing and it like just transforms and everything. Yeah. 
Absolutely. And I think that then you appreciate the growth that it takes to get from next step to next step. I also think that the lessons that you learn remodeling it or fixing it up are just totally valuable and you just will always appreciate it forever. You appreciate it much more. Our very, so um, when we first started, we just had like a little weekender. And so here it was three um, kids and then me and my husband. And that was so trashed. And me and the kids fixed it up. We painted it and we um, like did everything. We made it so cute and put lights in it. Like we just did all the cute things to it. And and it was one of our favorite like remodels. But it, I think we only got to use it for a couple rodeos because we quickly realized it was not going to work. We tried to put the boys in tent. And I mean, we're talking, this is our very first travel rodeo and it's still their favorite memory. They're, they've done amazing, cool things. We've gone to nationals and done all the coolest rodeos, but still that very first rodeo where they were in the tent that leaked and it rained and the cold front came through overnight. It's still the greatest memory. And that was not in our nice trailer that we have now. It was in our dumpy little trailer that we had fixed up. And even our nicest trailer we still fixed it up because it just is what it is. You got to do what you got to do to make this thing happen. And um, I think that it's good for kids. It's good for parents. It's good for everything to be able to really grow and appreciate it all. Oh yeah. Some of the best memories in rodeo come from rainy weekends or just things that go wrong. It just makes you appreciate everything you have so much more. Yeah. What is one of the ways you're able to balance rodeo with your singing career? Um, for the longest time, I wouldn't, I tried, I still yes and no, like now I'm getting into more where I miss more rodeos than I used to and gigging more on the weekends, like if it's travel shows. Um, but for the most part, I don't really play on the weekends. Like I play during the week, I play shows and then like regular spots of shows and so that I could go to their rodeos on the weekends because we would travel all the time for that and so I miss a lot of the practice times and um some of that just like at home stuff I was there for a lot of it early on um but then I've missed oh missed a lot of that and so it kind of comes with the territory but we all made an agreement um that basically I wasn't going to be mad at them if they didn't come to shows and they weren't going to be mad at me if I didn't um, make it to every single rodeo and that we could both, we could all pursue our passion and just kind of come back and talk to it, talk about it together, you know, at the end. And, um, and it's worked for us. It's been good. It's a challenge for sure. Making it all work. It's a challenge. And I'm, I mean, we all miss a lot of different things but we all definitely support each other and definitely um try our hardest to to be there um when we can for sure that's awesome that y'all are all able to pursue your own dreams and be able to do what makes y'all happy but also come back and share the milestones and everything with each other yeah Um, what are some of the ways you like choose where you sing Um, that just all depends. Like some, a lot of it throughout the years, I think God just kind of opens doors, honestly. Um, most of the big ones, most of the big ones anyways, God's just made it happen. And every time I sit back and I'm like, oh my gosh, I don't even know how this worked out. Um, some of the stuff I meet people at shows, like I just, I go with the whole thing, be nice to everybody because like, I'm not, well, number one, I'm not going to be nice. I'm not going to be mean. Like I'm doing my best to be nice to everybody. But also when you're just able to make friends with whoever it is, and then you realize, oh, wow, they have houses wherever, or they do this, whatever, you know what I mean? Or they, and you're just approachable and um, having fun. And so then one opportunity leads to another opportunity leads to another opportunity and just building relationships with people. um, That's been a super big deal. I've never had a booking agent. I would love a book. I would love somebody to take over the booking period, Um, but I've never had one. And because uh, early on, somebody said, nobody works harder for you than you. And that's absolutely true. And in an independent music career, it's very true. Like I'm the one that's invested in this. And so at the end of the day, it all falls on me. So when it comes to all of the decisions that have to be made, and there's a lot of them, um, decision-wise, business-wise, creative-wise, just everything, um, there's a lot of them. At the end of the day, I got a ton of input from amazing professionals who've been in the industry for years and years and years, Um, longer than I've been alive. They've been in the industry. And um, so I get that kind of input. But at the end of the day, I'm the one that has to live with it. You know, I'm the one that has to live with all of it. So um, 
a roundabout way to say booking wise, it's building relationships and it's just uh, kind of just staying out there and doing it and also just trying to keep it in check. And I think that God's honored the fact that I've tried to be with my family. God's honored it with other opportunities. The fact that I was able to do the NFR at my level is only God. Like really, it's just only a, a awesome miracle that I was able to to do opera, have an opportunity like that and the Braves and just any of the people I've been able to open for and any of the festivals I've been able to play and concerts I've been able to do, like, those are long years. What was your favorite um, venue that you were able to play? I know you said you did Braves and the NFR and you have all these different ones. What was your favorite? Those are um, really big, cool ones that I absolutely love, love, love. And they're amazing, like core memories that I will remember forever and ever and ever. Um, at the same time, there's certain shows that I will play to 20 people or to 100 people. And they're some of my most favorite shows and favorite memories, too. So I have um, just even recently we played Eddie's Attic in Atlanta and it's, you know, 100 people. And it was so fun. Like it was just it was one of my favorite shows ever. Um, and everything just kind of came together and the people were amazing and I just loved it. Um, so it's not even the size that makes the favorite always. It's um, a lot of both. Like it's a lot of, there's a lot of factors. So I don't have a specific because I think if I said, like there's been bonfires on the beach, but it's just me and this group of 20 people and we just had the best time, you know, like we just, they, they sang and they danced and I, they listened to my songs and my stories and, and it's a beautiful sunset and that's amazing. But then I go in front of 40,000 people and sing the anthem and that's incredible too. So they're all my favorite. I'm not sure if you can hear me that good. Um, so I'm sorry. Uh, I know how you said that the smaller venues were some of your favorites because there's more memories that are able to be made there. Um, that makes a lot of sense to me. Like I can relate that to rodeo and everything because some of the smaller youth rodeos that not a lot of people come to watch, there's more memories to be made there than at a big rodeo where you have thousands of people watching you. Yeah. It's just, you make more memories and have your friends there and it just, I think it's pretty cool that some of your favorite shows were the smaller ones too. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that even then you're hitting personal milestones at some of the smaller rodeos, like they might be your personal milestones that are really big deals to you and what you do rodeo wise. So yeah, I just, I think I love it when you love what you do, then it doesn't really matter. I'll tell you my least favorite is when people be running their mouth during a show. I can't stand it. I'm like, how about you take your conversation somewhere else? Everybody is having, everybody's trying to listen. Literally, you're the only three people <laughs> talking right now. Could you yeah. shut up or go outside? I'll tell you <laughs> my least favorite. <laughs> I like I like how you said um a personal milestone. I think sometimes we can compare ourselves to these huge people or someone who may have been doing it longer than us. Like Maybe, I mean, obviously there are smaller shows that we want to do or smaller rodeos that we want to do, but we can't always compare ourselves to this person who's been doing it so long. We can't compare ourselves and say, we are only going to go to all these PCA rodeos and all these PRCA rodeos um, because this is how this person, you can't compare yourself like that. Maybe it's winning that small jackpot or maybe it's getting that buckle from the buckle series. I think that it's a small steps for you and your personal. Stop worrying about what, other people's doing and how other people's rodeos are going. I think that the small steps, the small milestones for ourselves are the big things. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think that you'll end up spoiling the journey for yourself because really, even when you make it all the way to the very, very top, it doesn't mean that um, then it's what are you chasing? So if you constantly are not enjoying the small ones or every weekend, you know what I mean? You're not, some of them are going to be better than others, obviously, but if you don't enjoy the journey all the way up, then you're not going to enjoy it when you get to the top. You're going to be like, Oh, that was it. Like that's now what No, you know what am I doing now? So really yeah. all this from the small ones to the big ones, if you don't find a way to just find a uh, joy and happiness in all of it, the highs and the lows, because that's what it is. Super duper high highs and super low lows. Find a way to steady yourself somewhere in the middle 
then um, you can enjoy it all the way. Whether you make it to the top or not, you're still loving that you won your first PCA. Who cares if you didn't win Cheyenne? You just won your first PCA. That's amazing. You right. know, like enjoy every single one of them. I know I was um, gone for a little bit of the Zoom call. Um, I don't know if we've covered talking about the NFR and the build up to the NFR. Um, if we haven't, can we talk about that just a little bit? Yeah, we um we covered it a little bit, uh, just talking about how just we you know how I book things and such. Um, the actual NFR was amazing. It was one of those um memories that I just absolutely love so much. My buckle is one of my most favorite things I have. If I if there was a fire, I would be running to get that. Um, <laughs> So and I love it so much. Um, yeah, I loved it. And like, just, I remember the feeling every single bit of it. And I hope that I remember it forever because walking down the alleyway, like the hallway, um, I was actually really sick that week. I coughed and coughed and coughed and it was horrible, but it stopped just long enough for the anthem. And then by the time I got in the Escalade leaving, it started right back up again. So but I got to sing the anthem. I got to enjoy the NFR that night. And um, my family, we got to sit down on the, like, right behind the judges. Like, de- like dirt fell through. We had NFR dirt all over us, you know. <laughs> it's awesome, right? And I so we asked oh. the kids if they wanted to go back the next day. And they were like, why? Why would we go back? We had the most amazing seats that you could ever have ever. Like, why would we want to go back again and sit, you know, in the nosebleeds or whatever? So, um, yeah, it was really, there's so many aspects of it that were just surreal, that were just really, really, really fun. You said we had NFR dirt flying all over us. Oh my gosh. <laughs> like, it's all over you. Like, it was so much fun. And then you're well, just all right there, like, just the wrong part like I'm telling you like it was so fun I took pictures of it on their felt hats the black felt hats I took pictures of the dirt on it <laughs> well I know that um I was in Las Vegas for the NFR and I'm sitting there and uh I'm with Mike Gilliard actually and we're sitting um we were in the hotel I don't exactly remember what we're doing but they had the NFR playing and we're like that's Casey Kearney we're, <laughs> <laughs> we're practically besties and she's singing the NFR I think that um, the cool thing, the cool thing with you, and this is like, this is one of the things that I love about what you do is like, you, you're so well with your social media. I kind of want to talk about the importance of social media. Like, you, it's like, I feel like I'm a Kearney half the time. Like, I feel like, I'm, I feel like I'm traveling, I feel like I'm traveling the rodeo and the, and the, <laughs> in the roads with Casey Kearney. Like, she does such, you do such a great job. Like, hey, I'm going here, invite these people. Like, I feel like I'm traveling with you. I feel like we know you Aww. so much better because you do so well on your social media. Can we talk a little bit about the importance of social media other than the aspect of it brings people and, um, but like, I feel like people feel like they know you so much more because you um, have your social media and you do so well with that. I appreciate that so very much. I have very much a love-hate relationship with social media. And I finally just had to like, even the other day, TikTok, I made it mad. I made a mistake and I made it mad. And so finally, I'm just like, how many apologies do you need? You know what I mean? Like, can we just go back to when you love me? Um, but it, it was, it's, um, I love, it's super important to me and I enjoy being able to connect and I enjoy being able to talk to people and being able to have that outlet to be able to um, communicate with everyone. Um, I also, my family doesn't always love it because they think I post everything. It's so funny though, how much I don't post. Like I post the things that I can post and there's so much of it that I don't post. And I'm like, see, I could be posting this. Every time they say I post everything, I'm like, I could be posting this right now and I'm not. So, um, yeah, you know, I mean, it's finding the balance between raising three teenagers who may or may not want uh, all of everything out there. And then also um, connecting with people because I do love it. I love that people. And I also think it's funny that most people my music is secondary to the actual rodeo road and the kids and all that, even people who are don't rodeo. So the people I play music for, most of them don't rodeo. And so while it's normal to our life that we, that we talk rodeo, they don't, they don't understand any of it. That's why I'll do like the trailer tour and like, this is how we do this and this and this because people don't know. And so um, some of it's like educating in that kind of way. And then some of it's just to keep them along the journey. Um, algorithms are not my friend I also hate the fact that you get one mastered and then you got to learn a different one and I'm like can we just stick with one and just 
stay there, you know. I also wish I had to work TikTok early on. I don't know if y'all are TikTok people, but I wish that I had done it four years ago when everybody was doing it and blowing up on it, but I didn't. I was late to the game. I only started it a couple months ago, and um, but it's going, you know, it's working. It's funny how Born to Rodeo, that's the one everybody cares about. And if I post anything else outside of Born to Rodeo on TikTok, no one cares. Um, but Born to Rodeo, they care about. So that's cool. Uh, but yeah, is there what is there anything specific you want to know about social media? No, no that, that was great. That was great. I was just, I mean, it's just so cool. We feel like we, I, but at least me, feel like I know you yeah. so much more because of your social media. And uh, speaking of the Born to Rodeo song, they played that at the Milton PCA. And I was like, yeah. I just talked to this lady. <laughs> and there's so yeah. many people there. And they're playing this. And I was like, this is so cool. Do you you know what? It's been yeah. so fun. It's been so fun. And people will send me videos of it getting played at all these random places. And it's so much fun. So um, I love that. P same thing with Waffle House. The so Waffle House, my song, is in all the jukeboxes at Waffle House. And so people will send me videos all over the country of them playing my song in their Waffle House, you know. So that's always so much fun, too. And, um, yeah, but actually what's so fun about Born to Rodeo is I wrote it um, one year ago yesterday. And so one year ago yesterday, I was sitting on the couch in my living room and I wrote it and um, and it's done all this already. And so for me to have went, I went into the studio a few weeks later in September, we recorded it and then we didn't end up, I wanted it released before the NFR and then it didn't happen. So um, it didn't get released till February and it's just kind of been a slow growth kind of thing. But every time I move away from it, I end up going back to it like people it's it's not it's not done running its course yet it's kind of a little engine that could i think and so it um when it hit a hundred thousand streams that's my most i've ever done and so that was extremely exciting and a bunch of cowgirls on tiktok are using it so that's really awesome um for having its slow growth with that too so micah was kind of mad about that i'll tell you that whole story too because i wrote it Micah inspired it. My middle child, Micah, he's 17. Um, and he goes hard, hardest of all the kids for rodeo. He goes hard, hard, hard. And he wants to go all the way like he wants it. Um, so I wrote the song because he had said to me, I was getting on to him, he was in trouble. And he's like, Mama, I'm just living on Red Bull in a dream. And I was like, I'm probably going to use that in a song because it's a really good line. But you're still in trouble. And so I did, I used it in the song and I wrote the song and actually gave him co-writer. I put him on as a co-writer um, because of how much of it was inspired by him. Well, I, I got too many requests to do a girl version. And I told him, I was like, look, this is not, uh, I still wrote the song, it's still your song, but this is a business decision <laughs> because cowgirls will make the videos. Cowboys, not necessarily, but cowgirls will make the videos. So yeah. I made the cowgirl version. Um, we recorded it. We read. I redid the vocal on it, and released it. And so it's done better on TikTok, and they want it on Spotify, but I haven't. So it's kind of funny. Like that's been a that's been a war. He was like, "Of course I'm the middle child," and still my song that was written about me is still gonna get ignored. Like he plays that a lot. It's pretty funny. He's I not actually traumatized, but he's gonna give me a hard time about it forever. <laughs> it's a great song. Thank you. I think it's just so awesome, like, how you were able – I know – didn't you use um, one of the local arenas to record the – Yep, Baker. Video for – Yeah. I think it's so cool that you're able to use, like, just places around here and record that video with your family and everything. And just, like, it's so awesome that y'all are able to work together to, like, create your vision to come true. Yeah. I mean, some of it's dragging them there because, you know, they got lives and they have things they want to do. But then some of it, they had a lot of fun and they were super sweet to do it. Um, they were really, that was a late, late night. So we shot, we filmed one night, the night before we filmed out here at our house um, in front of the barn. And that's the rhinestone ranchy and then the performance video that was at my house with the barn in the background. And um, then the next, and that went till like two in the morning. And then the next night we were at Baker Arena. And we shot till like 3.30 and it was, so, and then I had like a flight the next day. Like it was, yeah, it was a lot, but I loved using the local arena. I loved being able to, um, to include everybody that I could include. Like, yeah, it was really fun.
And the kids, did, the kids did good. I will say this. So they had, we didn't end up using much of the footage, but the videographer had the lights turned off in the arena. So then he's like, okay, y'all rope in the dark. And so the lights are off and it's just these like filter, like spotlight kind of deal. And it was really beautiful except for, and it was making beautiful shots, except for y'all could imagine how hard it is to rope in the dark. Yeah. And then we come to steer wrestle and he's like, okay, jump off the horse in the dark. You know? Oh, wow. Like, this is scary. I think he only did it a couple of times because it was like, it was a little unsettling. It was quite the challenge, but it was fun. Took, took some blood, sweat, and tears in that, didn't it? Yeah, it did. <laughs> and then we ended up using um, some Baker Rodeo footage for the local rodeo and then the high school national finals uh, footage. We had got the, we collaborated with the videographer from the national high school finals that were in Wyoming. And we used some of that footage to mix in there too. So cool. So cool for sure. I saw the video from um, the girl version of Born to Rodeo yeah. and how you use like um, the girls from high school nationals as one of the videos on TikTok. I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah, that was the state finals, the Alabama state finals. So all those were little Alabama girls. And I just kind of videoed them like I want to say it was even the last day and I just kind of videoed them a little bit I'm going to do a few more of those when I go when we have another rodeo because those do really well um but I did do a little bit at nationals but also like I would have filmed a lot more at nationals if um but it was also it's about the kids you know what I mean and so I didn't want it to end up being like a work trip or a you know, a music trip or end up doing that. So I wanted them to be able to just enjoy it and relax. And that's also part of finding the balance. Do I think they would have cared? Probably not. But I also still don't want them to grow up and be like, yeah, literally everything was about music because it's not, I want it to be able to be in the moment. This is nationalist and they could, you know, enjoy that moment while they were there at the same time career wise would it have been better for me to go shoot some girls at nationals so I could have some cowgirls from all over the country in there. Yeah. Yeah. But here we are. <laughs> so you make some sacrifices, but. Right. I know uh, <laughs> earlier you brought up the song Rhinestone Ranchy. I remember uh, that that's a newer song, right? Yeah. I remember um, that the first time I ever even heard Rhinestone Ranchy, just that name. It was, it was actually like a Facebook video with you in it. And uh, I, I think your kids were making fun of you and you were saying you're, you're Rhinestone Ranchy. You're not a buckle bunny. Like, um, I, I talk about how that song started and how has it went? Um, it's gone pretty good. Like I said, though, every time we go try to get away from it, uh, we everything goes back to Born to Rodeo because I have several songs I'd like to release. Um, but like I said, Born to Rodeo hadn't run its course yet. So, but Ryan Stone Ranchy, I'm, it's not for everyone. It's but the audience that it's for gets it. You know what I mean? It's a if you know, you know kind of deal. Yeah. So, um, it really it's not for. I didn't write it for the world. I wrote it for the girls that get it, you know, and yeah. um, that's what happened. So I, um, it was really even, I was one of those ones and it goes over really well live. Everybody loves it live. Um, even if they don't understand it. Cause you know, y'all would understand the only bronc I ride is sitting in the driveway on 35s. You yeah. get out ride broncs. I drive my Bronco with right. size 35 tires. Um, right. The average person, I'll just go ahead and tell you, does not get that line. The only cans I chase, y'all get it. That's barrel racing, you know, right. and, uh, where the average person doesn't get those like connections. At the same time, I didn't write it for everyone. I wrote it for the people who get it. If you know, you know, if you're a little fancy and you're a little bit country, then you get it. But yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. What are some or who are some of the people who have helped you the most throughout your career? Um, I would say, well, first of all, my family, for sure. My husband, he gets stuff done always um, when I'm not there. So then I'm able to travel and I'm able to be gone at night and do all the things. So number one, for sure, credit where it's due is my husband. Number two would be Annabelle because <laughs> she's my daughter. And since the time she was tiny, she would make the lists and do all the lists and make sure everybody, anything I forgot, like to make sure I didn't forget or to make sure that um, everything was covered. Um, so those two right there, my boys are super helpful and sweet, but not as much as Scott and Annabelle. Uh, career wise, my producer, Doug Cahan, he's done most everything I've done. Um, 
and he's recorded most of all the music and he's I've just learned so much from him over the years and I've been able to write with a lot of cool people that's been really fun I've also um every musician you learn something from somebody everywhere you know what I mean even if they're awful or even if it goes south or even if it's um great and I'm still friends with them all to this day um you learn something from somebody all the time so all the bands I've played every guitar player I've ever had like I learned something from each of them and so all along the way I would say they all contributed I feel like I try to just take nuggets from everything all the time um yeah I would say podcasts um there's quite a few podcasts I'm a nerd and I like to listen to business podcasts music ones and uh just motivational ones and uh church ones and funny ones and murder ones like all of them <laughs> straight across the board <laughs> and so the reason I, I say pocket that that contributed because sometimes if my brain gets all jumbly I can listen to any of these business podcasts or I can listen to these musician ones or songwriting ones and I can hear oh wow they are having the same issues as I am, you know, and they are having um, going through similar things or they're doubting their self like I do. And um, and it's super duper helpful. And, and it's really it's helped me get over humps when I'm just like ready to give up. It's helped me to get over those humps and just and I drive a lot. I'm in my vehicle a lot driving for hours and hours and hours every week. And so when I listen to them, then that helps keep me on track. I've seen that nice Bronco in Holt. I've seen it. <laughs> well, I was like the first one in the county to have one. And so everybody would stop. And then when people started copying me, some of the stuff I had done to it, then I was like, oh, I'm about to mod this so that nobody has it. So now it's got so many mods on it. Like you would have to get it. Like you'd have to really work at it to get it matching. But now I'm almost at 60,000 miles. I've had it since 2021. I don't even know that I'd I never want to get rid of it. I can't think of it other than the fact that it's not comfortable like at all. Uh, and I drive way too. It's not meant to be a daily driver. And I drive so much. I'm literally sore because I've had to drive back and forth. I'm literally, my back hurts from it. Um, I love it. I love it so much, but <laughs> not practical. And I got a really good deal on it uh, when it was in between. And they were really rare. I called around the whole country, though, find a new one. <laughs> it was a whole thing and I bought that joker myself like I'm still obviously I'm still paying on it but I bought that joker myself it was really great <laughs> I say that I say that I sold my Tahoe anyways you don't really care I'm just saying I love it so much <laughs> I, I like it what is one of your favorite songs you have ever written <sighs> okay so that's hard because I like I like several different ones for different reasons. And some of my favorite that I've ever written aren't necessarily the ones that people have liked the most. Um, because there's one like, we're going to make this work. It's on my album. And it's me and my husband. And I love that song. Does it do well at all? No, not really at all. But I love that song. Um, even Coffee. It's like, I remember the day I wrote it. I remember what I was feeling when I wrote it. Does it do great? No. Most of them are just like slow ballads. I love Waffle House because I love the people I wrote it about. And it's been really good to me. I love Born to Rodeo because it's about my family. I've got a couple songs that I've written that I haven't uh, recorded yet. And they're kind of, they're my new favorite babies right now. They're kind of my favorites right now. Um, so when I do get those recorded, I think that they'll probably be up there with my favorites. Um, yeah, I can't, I can't pick one. I can't pick a favorite because some of them, I mean, and I think that they just all have their own story with them. So about when or how, now there's a few, like we've got the one I'm fixing to release. Um, it should come out in the next few months. Uh, it's called long way around and it's a ballad that me and my fiddle player, Amy wrote, and we wrote it in a Bucky's parking lot. And so does the song have any like special significance? Not really, but th where we wrote it was so fun. Like it was just fun. And uh, I remember writing it and having a good time writing it. So, yeah. I think that's really cool. Like how I understand, like you can't pick a favorite because like you've written them all and it's like, they're all amazing for all these different reasons. But I think it's so cool how every time you write a song, you can always look back and think, hey, I remember when I wrote that one. That was one of my favorite ones to write. I got to write that one with my friends. And I think yeah. it's just super cool. Like each song holds a different memory. It does. And 
especially that Waffle House song, how you said they put it on the jukeboxes in Waffle House. That's really awesome. Um, but they, it was really, it was a cool opportunity and um, that they did that. You know, it's funny, like, I can just as much if you had to ask me what's my least favorite song I ever wrote, I could probably list you out just as many that are my least favorite that people like that I don't even like. I wrote it and I remember writing it and I remember liking it at the time. And then I'm like, this is not, I don't even like it that much. And um, technically, like, there was a phase I despised Guns and Glitter. It was my very first song I ever got on the radio, my very first song that ever, um, that I released when I really tried to go after it for a career. And it was like the only song everybody record, requested all the time. And so I was so sick of it. And I was like, I hate this song. Oh my, why did I even write it? Um, but then you realize like, I love everybody still jams to it. Everybody still likes it. And it's like eight years old. You know what I mean? I'm like, everybody still wants to hear it. And that's cool. And technically I didn't write it. It's not about guns and glitter at all. Like I wrote it. I was really, I was coming out of like major like depression and stuff. And don't you dare believe I'm weak. My nerves are steel. When I wrote it, I was writing the opposite of how I felt. Because at the time, I felt really, really weak. And I had no nerves of steel. I was a disaster. And um, so I really wrote it. So I was like, what are some things that make me happy, that make me feel tough, that make me feel strong and beautiful? I was like, it's guns and it's glitter. And that's what I'm going <laughs> to so that's how it really came about. So I remember the day I wrote it. I remember I was writing myself out of a funk. Like I was right. I had written piles of sad songs and I was like, I've got to write something that's just like not sad. That's obvious. And so it ended up being that like to where it sounds like I'm way tougher than what I really felt at the moment, you know, that kind of deal. So I'm fond of that now. And I think you grow out of, I think when you, the more like mature you get as far as that, like I see the songwriting things I could have done differently now, but also I appreciate that people still like hearing it. Like people still want to hear it. So thank you. Yeah. I'll keep singing it. As long as you want to hear it, I'll keep singing it. <laughs> so yeah. I, a show doesn't go by that we don't play guns and glitter. I like how you said it was the opposite of what you felt at the time. Yeah. I, I love that. I think sometimes we have to b literally believe and speak it into existence on the change that we want. Yeah. I think that we can get so built up and set, write, writing down these long, petty things about us and how bad our life is and how it's not going to change and we can sit here and sing a million sad songs y'all get me preaching up in here in just a second but we can get <laughs> we can get upset and we can get so like we really have to speak the change that we want if we're always speaking negative into our life we will believe that's the truth and we're going to believe that's the way it's going to be and and eventually we'll be okay with it so I like how you said, I wrote the opposite of what I was feeling. And it might not, you might not have believed it at all at the time. At the time you're writing it, you might not have believed, I'm going to be able to get out of this. I'm going to be able to keep going. I'm going to be able to keep pushing through. But speaking it out is, I think, a huge thing. Um, whether whether it's not even possible in our own minds, yeah. it doesn't have to be possible in our own minds. But I think speaking it out is such a big, bold thing to do. Yeah, I mean, it's absolutely true. And the thing is, is that when you're creating art, there's the balance between getting getting out the pain and getting out the feelings, but not staying there and not writing from a place of pain and not writing from a place of uh, sadness and writing from a place of um, just constantly staying there, but really just um, move speaking out, speaking yourself out of it and just moving out of it. And so if you listen to like even coffee, that's the day I just didn't, I wasn't, I was tired and I was burnt out and everything. And that's when I wrote that. That's when I wrote that. And that's for that moment. That's what exactly what I needed to do was write those feelings. I'm tired. And like, this is it. And then, but I didn't stay there. We move on and we go write something that's like, Hey, we're getting out of this. We're moving forward. You know, like we're, we're, we're tough and we're, you know, like you said, just speaking our way out of it. I love that. I love that so much. It's it's so bold to do that, and it, it and it can be scary, honestly. It really yeah, can be scary, and it's hard, and you have to make yourself. I mean, because and a lot of writers and artists, a lot of them struggle with a lot of those. You know, feeling. it's why if you hear everybody talk about it's harder to write a fun song than it is to write a sad song. And when you go see a lot of singer songwriters, uh, how they all do like these sad, depressing, slow songs. I don't know if you've ever noticed that, but there's a lot of it. Um, the thing is, is that yeah. That's because that's what's easy to come out. You almost have to make yourself like really 
work on it. Um, even my song Better Days, um, I had a couple, I, I remember thinking, I have some friends and their life is really crappy right now. What would I tell them to make them feel better? And that's when I wrote Better Days. And I was like, you know, it's okay. It's okay to laugh. It's okay to smile. It's okay to take a break from these trouble because better days are coming. It's not going to stay this way, you know? And Sirius XM played that one for a hot minute, which was really, really amazing. They've never played anything else since, but they played it for that one for a hot minute. So we're going to ride that train. Um, but yeah, they, uh, it's, yeah, it's the same concept. No matter what the song is or the situation is, it's just not staying in the dark places, making yourself get out of it. Not a choose. Don't get me wrong. I won't go on that trail. I won't go on the trail. We'll just leave it there. We'll leave it there. As somebody who's dealt with anxiety and depression, I'm not a choose to be happy advocate just because physically and chemically things happen that you really physically cannot get yourself out of. At the same time, you can pray and you can work towards it and you can constantly crawl yourself out and baby step yourself out of the dark hole and out of the dark places. And I think that that's where I'm at with it to tell, to try to encourage people, like, especially coming from a church background my whole life, um, where it's really like, we can tell you speak life, speak life, but absolutely truth, absolute truth. Also, honey, go to the doctor and get your hormones checked. You know what I mean? Y'all are way too young to understand that, but I'm just telling you, it goes deeper than that, that there's a whole lot to, um, you know, a whole lot to it. For sure. For oh, sure. A whole long rabbit trail about it, but <laughs> y'all are young to talk about it with. But Well, I loved how you said, like, your song, Better Days, how you wrote it. Like, what would I tell my friends going through this time? So it was like you were trying to write a song that kind of, like, helped you understand your feelings, but, like, it also helped other people yep. to know that they're not alone and that, like you see them and that everything will be okay and there will be better days. Yep. Yep. It's true. Sure. Most people just want to be seen and related with and most that you, that you care and that you know. And I think that's, I need it. Everybody needs it really. Sure. So, yeah. Well, we are going to close the podcast. Um, the last question we have for you is what legacy do you hope to leave behind? What, what legacy does Casey Curry hope to leave behind? Um, whether it's his performance at the end of the day. It's, I think that's such an amazing question. And yeah, I I think legacy for, I think it's the whole, I mean, obviously the obvious is never too late. Obviously just like, don't quit, don't give up. I think really it's more like a, she didn't stop trying. You know what I mean? Like I want my kids to grow up and be like, she had went through some stuff and she had some big hills to climb, but she didn't stop trying. And I think that if I can encourage other people to not stop trying, like to just not to just keep on going, like whatever your mountain is or whatever it is, if y'all can just keep on going, you know. I love that. I love that for sure. Is there anything else you'd like to say before we close the <clears throat> I think that you guys are amazing and I love uh, talking to you guys and I am so excited to see what you guys do with your life. I think that y'all are very well spoken and very interesting and great conversational kids that I think that y'all are going to do great things in life. So I appreciate so much you guys having me and uh, getting to chat with y'all. I've done a pile of podcasts and I got to tell y'all, y'all are super duper talented and you, I just am impressed by both of you. I think y'all are great. I could Thank talk you. for a couple more hours with you. There's so much more <laughs> we want to learn, Thank but you. we got to keep it an hour. So we appreciate yeah. your time. And I know you said this was your your only off day for a while. So we appreciate you taking it off to do this with us. I know it's going to help some people and help people that want to chase their dreams in the direction that you're chasing your dreams. And I think you really do inspire people in the way that you do and the attitude that you have. <laughs> well, thank you so much. I appreciate it. All right, well, we can say a prayer real quick to close it out, and then we'll stop the recording. But, Lord, thank you so much for this day. Thank you that we were able to have this podcast with Miss Casey today um, and that she was able to have a day where we could all meet and just talk about her milestones and her career. And I just thank you that this podcast will probably help so many people and that we can – continue to glorify you through our podcast lord i ask that we're able to help as many people as we can with this story lord and i just ask that you 
bless Miss Casey's music career and keep her going, Lord. And I just ask that you keep us safe, happy, and healthy, and that we can glorify you and honor you, Lord, in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you guys so much. I hope to see y'all at a rodeo sometime soon. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. You're awesome. Bye. Mm -hmm.